Welcome back. ANC Secretary General Ace Mahashule says the party's prime goal is to heal divisions within the movement. Mahashule was speaking at an event to honor anti apartheid stalwart Walter Sisulu. To reflect on the legacy of Walter Sisulu, uh, we're joined now by two of his grandchildren, Duma Sisulu, son of Max and Eleanor Sisulu, and Nzigi Sisulu, daughter of Sheila and the late Mlungi Sisulu. Welcome to you both, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you for having us. So let's just first start with um, your earliest memory, and when you first realized that Walter Sisulu is who he is, and oh. the prominent politician that he is, because just having spoken to uh, the grandchildren or children of some of these, some of them, they didn't even realize that this parent, <laughs> this um, Kulu, this, you know, you'd hear that with the Mandela's yeah. as well. Let's start with Yinziki. Oh, really? Gosh, I, still, I don't think I've really fully realized even now, uh, mm -hmm. in part because one has not read the extent of his work, mm -hmm. uh, be it whether he was in uh, Tel Aviv or whether he was in Israel or whether he was in Russia because he had been so many different places and not all of it is documented, but he does attempt to document it in, in, in his own words uh, in, in the book that's called uh, I Will Go Singing, which he, he then uh, had put you mm -hmm. know, together something to indicate what he could remember. And, and that's what you've brought in. Yeah. Let me see if I could get the cameras to just zoom in on it. So when did you first come into contact, real contact with the content that is in there? Was it when you started <coughs> reading or people started telling you about it? You know, when we wrote, right, there, there was actually an unspoken rule that we actually never talked about what happened in the home and the politics that were being discussed because it just didn't seem like it was politics. All it was was fighting for the rights of other people, like human rights, basic rights, particularly of black people. So when Tatum Kulu was in prison, one would write letters. And all it was was, my grandfather is in prison, I'm writing a letter, then he was put in isolation, uh, in solitary confinement, and then I, apparently the re letter I wrote, and Aunt Eleanor talks about it, uh, uh, where I said don't punish my grandfather twice. He's already in prison now. You're putting him in isolation. I was in boarding school, so How that's why. How old like, were you then? Gosh, I was in boarding school. That was uh, standard five, standard six. So grade seven or grade eight? Mm -hmm. uh, five, six, seven. Grade seven or grade nine? Did you understand why he no, was in prison? No, not not fully. I don't think I understood fully, really. I honestly did not. As a result, when he was released, we were actually left at school, <laughs> in boarding school, so that, you know, uh, because I think our parents understood, and they thought it was just better for us to be in boarding school. We actually school. have an excerpt of that when he was released. Um, perhaps we can get that ready and uh, show it to our viewers. But let me come to you, Duma. You're obviously a lot younger, so when <laughs> did you start connecting with the great Walter Sisulu? And... Uh, did you ever reach a point where it went beyond just grandfather, where you saw him in his own right as this great political networker, this um, organizer, this uh, politician, the statesman? Mm, I don't think I, until maybe after my grandmother had her centenary, we actually started <laughs> grasping the work that our grandparents did. A lot of the time when I was with my grandfather, it was, you know, this funny, happy, homely guy who had a big heart and always felt uh, comfortable around. Um, my grandmother was a disciplinarian and he was very open and warm, so they contrasted each other a lot. Uh, so from when I was younger, when he passed away, I was about 14 or 15, mm. so I, until that point I hadn't really realized all that he had done. But when one time we were going to Palsmo Prison, um, there was an event that I can't remember what it was for, so I was you know, lucky enough to ride with him in the back of his car. Uh, and as we were traveling there, he then said to me, you know, he looked over and he said, it's finished. And obviously I was 10 at the time, so I didn't really know what it's finished meant. And he then went on and said, no, it's finished, uh, it's free, and you're free, and the ones who follow you will be free. At the time, I didn't quite know what that meant. Well, I can imagine at the age of 10, quite <laughs> a lot to take in at the age of 10. Um, and then in high school, we were doing history, and, uh, well, I wasn't doing history, my classmates, when they would come and show me things of my grandfather. And then I started to, you know, grasp that it wasn't just uh, my immediate circle that knew what he had done, it was actually mm. the whole world. And I want to make a point about that in just a moment, but let's take a look at this uh, excerpt of your grandfather coming out of uh, Robben Island. <coughs> there were times when I was right, quite prepared for that. And uh, uh, 
on the whole, I knew that the pressure uh, was building and that uh, sooner or later they would have to drive in. But did you so ever what? despair? Did you ever despair? No, never. It, it, it was not possible to despair because the spirit of the people outside was too great. So that is Walter Susuli there leading part of the defiance campaign leading him to that. I mean, he was arrested uh, about, uh, I think, it's seven times within that 10-year mm. period. Did he ever speak about that period in Tiki? Did he ever? And, and obviously, because you are older, you would have <laughs> been able to at least understand some of those conversations at that point. Yeah, I think uh, one had a chance to uh, visit Tatumkulu. Mm. I think, uh, you know, one didn't realize who he was in terms of uh, the influence and the, the stature of the man that we now know him to be. Uh, of course, I was, a, I was a child at the time, and, uh, you know, he was always very warm and paid attention to mm. everybody who was visiting. And, of course, Robin Island was through the thick glass and over the telephone and with the little... With that silver uh, microphone uh, that went through to, to transmit but he literally paid attention to you as even as a child and made time for you even though I was I may have been visiting with my mom Sheila or my dad Lungi you know because you, you only allowed one or you, uh, an yes. adult and then a child but that was that was uh, that was um, really how one got to interact with him but also Dr. Um, you know and Duma talks about how he said it was, it, um, it's finished uh, my, my son so he said the eldest was named by which means we are victorious uh, you know and he's the one pictured in that picture so he actually lived long enough to do that but I think what really struck me the most about that is that when he went to Washington DC and I was in the US on scholarship at the time uh, he asked to go for a walk in DuPont Circle and we walked and there were people who recognized him Mm. He stopped and he was amazed that they recognized him and they d so he, he just he also I think was not seeing himself as, he, as that yes he didn't he saw himself as part of a collective truly uh, you know and one who who may have been in leadership mm. yeah. and, and I mean I, I would like to just to uh, obviously paraphrase uh, what Uta Daniels Mandela said at his funeral when he was saying that he spoke of your grandfather as a leader of great humility of wisdom a unifier who was never a divider and someone who was patient are these the qualities that you uh, got to see before you got to know the man so to speak yes the, the, a lot to do with the patience um, some of the people in my family are not as patient as others. <laughs> my grandfather always had patience. So as kids would be running around his house and, you know, being kids, we'd be tearing things up. Um, my brother and myself are well known to be the leaders of the little terror pack. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we, he would never shout at us. He'd never raise his voice at us. You know, and even if we'd broken something, he would call us over and say, just come and sit down. And then he'd ask us what's happening. And so on. he would change the topic completely. We were in trouble at the moment, but when you were with him, you, it, it felt okay. And you wouldn't be uh, worried about anything else. And he had that way of making, even though we were not calm ourselves, when you got into his presence, you became calm and you became relaxed. And I felt that patience mm. um, about his humility um, my dad talks about it a lot mm. uh, my dad s says that he was so uh, humble and giving that he even gave away other people's things my dad would talk about how some of his clothes his favorite clothes he'd have kept uh, not worn for a long time and you know and Don would give it away when he saw another child in need and my dad was like no that was my Sunday's best my dad had kept it for a particular reason and mm. Don had seen another child, maybe a neighbor, who didn't have pants and he would have given it to him. Mm. So I spoke a lot when I was young to uh, his humility and these are the stories I'd hear from mm. my dad, my mom and some of my other cousins. Mm. So, so just mm. uh, going back to what Duma said, that he was able to read about your grandfather mm. yeah. in uh, school books, which I think, by the way, is a huge privilege mm -hmm. because for many of us, yes. we never had the opportunity to learn of any of our struggles, Star Wars, or mm -hmm. any of the mm -hmm. work that mm -hmm. they did. So it was obviously completely skewed in the history books. But you're saying see, that when he arrived in the US, lots of people knew him and mm -hmm. understood him. Does that put a lot of pressure on you both individually, being um, you know, the carrier of the Sisulu legacy and, and, and having to live under that spotlight? Mm -hmm. Let me start with you, Ziki. 
You know what? Thank you for that question. Actually, just just last year, I think two years ago, I, I had slowly made the journey into just kind of sort of um, standing in my heritage and and who one is and one who one is born of, uh, and not being apologetic about it, regardless of what the narratives may be. Uh, so it isn't so much as of a pressure. But I think last year when we did uh, Master Sulu's centenary, I did feel a sense of pressure and a sense of obligation, one, to make sure that Gogo was recognized as a person who contributed to the struggle, but that also not just as a wife to Walter Sisulu, but that Walter Sisulu did not pay lip service to issues of women empowerment and gender equality, but practiced it within his household. Because when Albertina Sisulu got married, one of the things she says is, I was emancipated as a woman when I got married because we did everything together. He actually practiced that in his very own home. So for me, there is a sense that it's not as much pressure, but an obligation. Like you said, not a lot of people know about our struggle icons and our struggle uh, uh, veterans. If we don't tell the story and we mm. think that somebody else is going to tell it, I think that time is over and I think I'm ready and Duma and I and the rest of the family, at least our generation, are going to step up Do and stand in our What are your thoughts on that? In particular, the pressure, um, expectations of you. Um, I don't know. We've n I've personally have never felt it as pressure because I've only grown up as you know, <laughs> Dr. grandchildren. So it wasn't a. Was it more privilege than pressure? I, I would guess it's privilege being able to talk to Dr. Kula and hear his pearls of wisdom when I was a lot younger. Um, there was a lot of things that he would say that didn't grasp then and later years you'd grasp. A lot of things that he'd tell my parents which my parents had passed down to me. So there's a lot of privileges in that sense. Um, and the, the, in terms of the pressure it was, I've not grown up anyone else, so I've not felt what it would be like to be somebody else. I've just known that this is my family and there's certain obligations we have as a family uh, and those are to celebrate our grandfather and grandmother's mm -hmm. legacy. Have you inherited or would you have liked to inherit some of his characteristics? And I'm <laughs> thinking here about he being um, uh, one of the first owners, uh, black owned estate agents in, or agencies in South Africa. I mm. mean, do you think you have some of that entrepreneurial spirit? The courage, <laughs> the conviction to do uh, unpopular things in the face of such... Uh, difficulties. With, with regards to entrepreneurship and particularly being a state agent, I myself with together my brothers, uh, I left, I used to work corporate 95, I've left corporate and now I do my entrepreneurship and we started a property company. Uh, where we do was that inspired by him by the way? I don't know if it was inspired at the time but in years after I then read about it and I said maybe it was something subconsciously might have said when I was younger and I didn't grasp. But I, we, we, do, we, we, we do property management, uh, rental management, uh, and yeah, we, I particularly look to uh, black families and try and figure out how, you know, black families today don't, might not have the um, knowledge and generational knowledge that some of the white families mm -hmm. might have in terms of how the value of real estate and these things work and the value of land. So what we try and do is try and um, simplify it and say you know you might not want to give you the uh, close the bond to your house you might want to use it to buy a second property and those kind of things mm. and Siki, perhaps you could just add to that because i see you, you you would like to but i'm also curious about yeah. another struggle that your yeah. grandfather would have faced because even politically mm -hmm. these were some of the taunts against him about his um his identity, mm -hmm. his heritage, the fact mm -hmm. that um, his father was white, that mm -hmm. he was tortured about that. Mm -hmm. Has that had any impact on your lives personally? Do you know anything about the Dickinsons, your mm -hmm. uh, grandfather's father? Mm -hmm. Is there any connection with that family? Yeah. Um, in, the, in the book, Albert T. In, uh, and Walter Sisulu in Our Lifetime, written by Eleanor Sisulu, their autobiography, she does go into the details, and they are part of our family tree. And uh, yes, uh, wa Aunt Eleanor has been able to engage, uh, but I, I think that we, they've agreed that we are as we are, and we and shall all you. continue in our paths. It, it, it's, it's, it, there is no shame in, in it and there is no uh, greatness in it. It just is. Mm, uh, it's that just a fact of life. It's just a eh? fact of life. And Tatum Kulu actually very consciously chose to be black and didn't choose to be colored or anything else. He simply said he was black. And, and then, and of course, my, like Duma, like, uh, like Duma, my late dad, Mlungi was the one who actually told us, you know, 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 you know
and he would explain what that meant and so we grew up within that lineage mm. and 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 so for for us the fact and of course people he was uh, taunted about it uh, but I, I think you know, uh, big ups to him because he decided to be on his mother's side and, and, and be black. Mm. And of course, they actually, uh, Ukoko Alice had two children uh, with mm. Dickinson. Mm. So it was Utatumkulu yes, and yes. yes. So, so it's, it's just that because it wasn't allowed, uh, you know, it was uh, against the law, they probably would never have been able to, to, to stay together much longer. Okay. And so I'm quite happy with so who I So I am. want to go back and reflect on uh, your grandmother <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> her impact on you spoke about her personality and obviously she was an activist in her own right what did you see of that dynamic and perhaps it's best to start with you Duma what did you see of that dynamic of the relationship between the two what it brought to um, just generally the struggle in South Africa for democratization but also in, in the family home uh, I'll start in the family home <laughs> the there wasn't a sense of superiority or anything. Mm -hmm. um, in our family, and to this the generation has followed, is that there isn't, you know, any kind mm -hmm. of patriarchy. It's the woman and the men, you know, it's everyone is equal um, and everyone is allowed their own fair voice. So I felt it come down in that way is that we don't have a situation where um, it's a dictatorship of one saying you need to go in a particular direction. Uh, no matter of your age, your gender, everyone has a voice. So I remember being very young and having family meetings and we'd raise things and complain to my dad about things. And instead of, if it were alone, he might have said, hey, I don't want to hear that. But we could, when we were out in the family, he said, okay, he'd value our opinion and what we want to say, and he'd accept it. Um, that was in the home. Um, in terms of the struggle, through last year we were doing my grandmother's centenary. Uh, we spent a lot of time traveling around and hearing what, a lot about what they'd done. Uh, and what struck me was that they were almost always viewed as, as uh, two sides of the same coin. They were never looked at as... Uh, Separately. Yes, they were never looked at... Well, they were, they were politicians in their own right, but they were never looked at as one is more senior mm. than the other. As if they were looked at as a unit. Yes, yes, yes exactly. Mm. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, it looked... It was more of a... It was a viewing of strength uh, that you don't have to... That as you as a man, you don't have to overpower your wife. You can be together and equal, and you are more powerful like that. Mm. And so it's just looking at the 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 Sisulu legacy as a whole. Then yeah. speaking of that, and and you, I think you both alluded to the fact that your grandmother was the more feistier of the two. What are some of the more fond memories that you have and that you remember of that? Um, of, of Gogo. Yes. Oh gosh, I always, I always say I, we grew up with a three course breakfast, you know. So we went to go, and then you had sorghaneti, and then you had, uh, you know, your sausage and your your uh, your tomato gravy, and so so Gogo. But at the same time, she had already cleaned the house, tidied up. It was five o'clock in the morning. She was prim, proper dress, shoes high shine, and ready to go and uh, attend to every woman in the in, in Soweto who needed to have a, a baby. And she would continue as a nurse and a midwife. But I think most importantly for me I think that Mkuli reflects this more um, concretely uh, uh, when he said during the 50th anniversary of their wedding and, I, and I'll just if you allow me yes, just to quote that she, uh, he said that she has kept the family together under the most difficult circumstances much of what we are as a family we owe to her she has been wonderful just wonderful so just to wrap up I mean you come from a family of activists. It wasn't mm -hmm. just your grandmother mm -hmm. and grandfather, mm -hmm. your um, uncles, your father, your mothers. Just what do you think you could do to add more to this legacy and, and, and in a manner that's relevant, especially to young people? Let me start with you, Duma. Yes, <laughs> to young people that will help them understand, especially the values and the principles. Um, the first thing which my father said to me is that you should, you know, the way you can continue the legacy is to celebrate the legacy. Celebrate the things your parents or your grandparents have done. In that way you will teach their values. Uh, I didn't, you know, know what he meant properly, but through the centenary last year I started to see it, is that we would have many celebrations and through the celebrations we teach the values of humanity, of peace, of justice for all, and through that is one way that you can forward, that I have been able to forward the legacy and forward uh, my bit to it.
All right, Ntiki, you find a word on that? Uh, I think wherever we find ourselves as, as a people, or even where I find myself in the Department of Women working in the gender space generally, is, is how you can make a difference where you are. Uh, and, and importantly, is that you are actually working towards the struggle that women have long embarked on and that that struggle continues even today as you and I sit here. Uh, that uh, Gogo fought for not a separate society from men, but a, a society that was just, not sexist, not violent, and equal for both men and women and so I will continue as a gender activist right there. And I want to thank you both for coming through and sharing your memories with us and uh, of course enlightening us on some of the things that we didn't mm -hmm. know that we can't find in books that we yeah. can't see in photos. We yeah. really really appreciated that there is uh, Ntsiki and Duma Sisu.